so hi everyone, I'm Simrit. I'm a data scientist with Math Street Den. Uh, it's a computer vision based AI startup and we work on a lot of cool stuff and uh, as a re-architecture for one of the projects, we uh, kind of uh, uh, re we basically kind of analyzed all the tools that we should be considering and that gave us the idea for this talk. So um, let's proceed. Uh, one second. Sure, okay. Uh, so what we are going to be doing uh, uh, in this talk is I'm going to help you uh, develop an idea of uh, what tools you should be considering for what kind of data set. Basically that's what uh, the title says that data comes in different shapes and sizes so you should pick your tools very wisely. And what I mean by data tool here is basically a software or framework that helps you explore and work with your data as simple as that. Okay, moving on. Uh, so there's a lot of content. I'll be rushing uh, uh, through the slides very quickly. So to help you uh, understand what's coming, uh, let me just brief you through. So we're going to be looking at a uh, few in-memory uh, data tools, okay? Uh, then followed by uh, benchmarks, their benchmarks. Uh, then we're going to quickly move on to benchmarks for big data tools, okay? And then uh, key takeaways, okay? Uh, basically, when to consider them, as simple as that. Okay, uh, so the plots, uh, the benchmark plots are basically going to have a uh, number of data points on the x-axis, which is going to be uh, powers of 10. On the y-axis, you're going to have time taken. Okay, so let's quickly uh, move ahead. All right, uh, so uh, to... Uh, help you understand uh, the performance advantage that NumPy gives you, I'll have to help you understand how Python works under the hood. So as you all know, Python basically uh, uh, keeps everything as an object. The function is an object, your string is an object, your integer is an object. So when you create a list, which is this one, basically, you're not actually holding the values in that list. You're holding objects which are internally referencing the values and the values are now scattered all across the memory. So you can see there's a bit of a performance overhead with that. Uh, so what NumPy does is it gives you a C array implementation of, uh, uh, it gives you the C array implementation, which uh, you can, you know, quickly get it that uh, it's going to be much better with the performance. Okay, uh, moving on. So we look at pandas. What uh, pandas is basically just a wrapper over NumPy, all right? So, but Panda gives you a lot more flexibility, okay? And the way it does this is basically it lets you store different, it lets you work on different data types, all right? Not like NumPy, which is just numerical. So what it does is, uh, the way it achieves this is by the concept of blocks, all right? Uh, so let's say I have three columns, uh, C1, C2, C3, and uh, they're of different data types, all right? So what this is going to do is, they're gonna, this is going to be a float block, an integer block, and an object block. All right, so what that means is each block is going to store the data of a particular data type. All right, um, so uh, you see that you get a bit, you get more features by doing this, but you should also understand that when you're doing this, you're actually scattering your data across different data, uh, across different blocks, okay? So you, you have a bit of an overhead there, um, okay? So it's a trade, kind of a trade-off, okay? Let's move on. Um, so this slide basically shows you what I've just said, okay? If you look at this part, I'm just showing you that the block n uh, at index number two stores the string values, okay? And it's of type NDRA, okay? And the next screenshot basically shows you that a block contains all the data of a single data type, which is the integer C1 and C2, all right? Uh, column C1 and C2, okay? So uh, what are the implications of this kind of an architecture? Now what happens is that uh, when uh, you're doing your slicing and dicing, okay, you're basically asking data from different blocks. okay. And so what Panda has to do is it has to take the data from all those different blocks and it gives you a copy. okay. So now when you make any changes over the copy, it's going to warn you. That's the warning. Okay, uh, then. Uh, the same same fu same functionality. Now this time you're doing it on a homogeneous data. Okay, C1 and C2 
is of integer type okay and uh, so what it does here is it leverages the performance optimization that numpy has under the hood which is working with references obviously copy is an expensive operation all right so if you if you now if you're slicing and asking for some data what it does it it just gives you the reference and now when you make certain changes it's going to reflect in your original uh, data set or data frame all right uh, so now we'll move on um, okay so r has been the favorite uh, of data analytics analysis when you're working with uh, in memory uh, data all right but um, uh, the native data tool that comes with r the data dot frame uh, is not that uh, good with its performance but well there's a good news there's a library called data dot table which is very good okay it is uh, optimized in a lot of ways and gives you a good very good performance boost okay so it's optimized by uh, it make it makes a lot of references avoids copies makes a lot of uh, function avoids uh, function calls lesser variable repeti uh, repetitions all right uh, so we'll move on so now we're going to be looking at the benchmarks and uh, i would say that i would uh, generally on a broader base i would classify uh, the data operations into two kinds sql and non sql okay uh, simple uh, uh, okay so i'm going to be moving through a lot of uh, plots and uh, it'll be better if you uh, move along with me rather than just going by the slides let me help you uh, understand so the blue line is r dot data table okay it seems to be doing pretty well followed by the green line which is uh, pandas okay now let's look at what's not doing the best you know what's doing the worst that's the pink line okay that's numpy now numpy is very bad when it's uh, reading from raw files all right but numpy gives you an option uh, that if you use uh, numpy serialized files you're going to get very good advantage which is this okay so if you have a numpy object you can save it as an npy file or an npz file and look at the performance speed that you get with that okay but if you don't have that you might want to read the data as pan through pandas convert it into numpy and maybe save it as uh, numpy serialized files all right um so now we'll look at group by operation okay um you can so you can see there are two uh, kind of lines okay the dotted and the solid okay uh, the solid is uh, the group by on string column and the dotted is the uh, group by on a numerical column okay uh, so again as you can see the blue line the data dot table is performing very well followed by the green which is the pandas okay and um, you also see a pink line here well let me tell you numpy does not support group by sql like operations so that is basically it tools being benchmarked there okay and uh, data dot frame is not doing so well all right okay so we now we'll go to merge which is an inner join and the blue which is again our data dot table is consistently performing well as an exception uh, data dot frame has on a string column has performed well here okay but it's an exception all right so we'll move on okay now this is something very interesting okay you have seen uh, you've seen and you know that our data dot frame are not so optimized they don't perform so well but you see something very strange here okay just to make you understand that graph i basically converted the x axis to a logarithmic scale and now you can actually understand who's standing where okay very surprisingly uh, our data dot frame has done very well here but if you look at the consistency our data dot table does very well overall okay um so we we'll look at the core utilization okay so if you're working with r okay you can see clearly see you're under utilizing all your resources okay uh, let's look at another example okay in this case i'm doing a numpy huge matrix multiplication and as you can see i have maxed out on my resources okay so what does this mean basically you are hitting the limit on what your in memory data tools can do for you after a certain point you can this it's going to it's going to be a point where uh, your returns are going to diminish as in uh, your 
programs are going to run slower. There's going to be more of uh, disk uh, swaps that are going to happen. And you, if your memory is full, you're out of RAM. Uh, you're basically hitting the limit, all right? And, uh, and, when, and when you are going back and when you're using just one core, you're basically not parallelizing your stuff. And if you, and if you look at the real life data, uh, what you collect in your real life, it's a lot. It's, it's not something that can fit in memory very easily. If you're working with production data, this is not the case. So moving to big data is inevitable. All right. Uh, so uh, like I've just said that uh, uh, there are limitations that you start hitting with these tools. Of course, they're your favorites. They perform very well, but they're good just for in memory data all right um, that can fit in memory okay r has its own limitation of 2 power 31 minus 1 vector indices okay so you start hitting limitations like that now we look at big data tools here i benchmark spark uh, and redshift all right the redshift is the red line you can see the yellow is the df and the black is the rdd they're kind of comparable that's because they are a, a distributed framework so they need to do a lot of work distributing their data so that's that's that behavior is kind of coming through this graph very easily you can see that similar behavior all right uh, now we look at aggregation which is grouped by again and you can see the red line which is redshift is doing very well okay followed by a blue line now what is the blue line the blue line is basically spark but the data is now materialized into hive okay uh, so basically you can see when it's uh, within the table they're kind of comparable now let's look at what are these two lines these are basically data held in memory this is in df and the black one is rdd okay um, uh, of course, so you can see DF is doing better than RDD if you have data in memory. What about inner join? All right. So in inner join as well, you can see Redshift is doing well. Okay. Followed by Hive, Spark with Hive. All right. But let's look at what's very interesting here is the difference between RDD and DF here. Okay. So clearly through the slides, you're getting a feeling that df is consistently performing better than rdd if you're working with operations in memory okay if you're going for a uh, table you would have to compare these two otherwise it would be an unfair comparison because uh, so that is data uh, materialized in hive for spark okay moving on sort here again you can see uh, comparable uh, performance okay uh, the red is the redshift again uh, and the blue is of obviously spark on hive what's very interesting is df has done well over here okay so what's the key takeaways when should you be considering r okay r is very good when you have when you have data that you can keep it in your memory and you want to do data analytics on it because data dot table is a brilliant package okay that gives you a lot of functionality and it's optimized to work very well you you should definitely try it out if you haven't you'll fall in love with this package all right uh, when should you consider numpy numpy you should consider when you have numerical operations in hand okay that's because numpy is a wrapper over optimized C and Fortran libraries. These have been optimized over years. So the performance is, you know, you, you, you have to go by NumPy if you want to uh, basically work on Python with numerical operation. It gives you uh, utils like linear algebra and uh, Fourier transform. All right? So that kind of functionality you get with NumPy. When should you consider pandas? You should consider basically consider pandas as your Swiss army knife. Okay. It, it's a wrapper over NumPy, but it gives you so much more. Okay. Uh, it lets you work with heterogeneous data, gives you SQL, non-SQL like operations. Okay. But there's a bit of a trade-off because it's a wrapper. You have the wrapper overhead. As you can see, I've just done a matrix multiplication and you can see a constant overhead of the wrapper itself. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's a, it's a trade-off. You get a lot more functionality, but you lose a bit on the speed. But uh, if you're working a production product, you might want to go with Pandas because it gives you so much more. When should you consider Redshift? Well, Redshift is an OLAP uh, engine. Okay, So what it does is it basically distributes your complex BI queries, which basically take uh, slow running queries into smaller chunks. So basically you're parallelizing and speeding up this very slow process. 
OK? And it can scale very well. It can scale up to petabytes of data with ease. And uh, the lot of the benchmarks, you can go through them. Uh, so basically, you should be considering this when you are working on uh, huge, uh, complex BI uh, queries. OK? Uh, Spark. So when should you be considering Spark? Well, Spark is another distributed framework, but uh, it's, it's of a different kind than Redshift. It, lets, it gives you the program, the f uh, ease of programmability. Also, it, let, it gives you the advantage of cheap cluster cost. How? It lets you build your clusters on spot nodes. And spot nodes are basically very cheap. Okay, You can go to the AWS console and look at the current pricing of the spot nodes and bid according, accordingly. And you'll be amazed at how much you're saving for your cluster. Okay, um, So if you do a cost comparison itself, you can look at the cost per uh, the on-demand uh, nodes cost for a uh, node that are used for Redshift and a similar kind that are used for Spark. There, basically, this is double the price of Spark. Okay, um, so uh, clearly, uh, I, I hope I've given you a good understanding of uh, uh, what you should be considering. Well, okay, um, so Spark, Redshift, Pandas, NumPy, and uh, uh, there uh, I've. I put up all the code that we have benchmark on the GitHub. It's going to be a very active repo. There's a lot more uh, work that's in progress, uh, and it'll be getting uploaded to the repo soon. Thank you. Any questions? And you're always free to uh, go back to the repo and uh, give suggestions. Uh, if there's something that you feel can be optimized further, uh, please uh, feel free to get in touch. Hi. Uh, yeah. Very good talk. Uh, Thank you. Uh, one question about Spark. Okay. So the uh, Spark, uh, the graph that you shown for Spark data frames RDDs, did you do a in-memory caching before uh, uh, running those operations, or was it before that? Uh, yeah, there was caching involved. Uh, caching involved, and it was in-memory. Yes. And uh, one more question: uh, the does Amazon Redshift uh, work on Hadoop? I never heard of Redshift. That's the reason I was oh, asking. Oh, uh, so this is a different uh, kind of a, a framework in itself. Okay. Uh, it's not a Hadoop based, yeah. Do you see a difference in the Spark when you see you run on OSC files, RC files, or Parky file? Uh, uh, I'm not a Spark expert myself, so I've not uh, worked with uh, Parkwits and I've not considered them uh, in the benchmarks as well. But a lot of members in my team, they work a lot. And uh, maybe if you want to uh, talk to them, maybe after the talk, we can, sure, yeah. Uh, have you explored Spark car? Uh, what's your takeaway from that? Oh, I have not, but I would love to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you.